Fungi are instrumental in maintaining the balance of our natural world, yet they are, unsurprisingly, underdocumented, which makes them especially vulnerable to the impacts of human activity and climate change. To shed light on the importance of fungal conservation, Norspor had the privilege of sitting down with Gabriella D'Elia, the president of the Fungal Diversity Survey. Gabriella is a passionate advocate and expert in the field of fungal conservation, and her work with Fundus represents a vital effort to protect and preserve these often misunderstood organisms. Join us as we explore the world of fungi and learn why their conservation is more critical than ever. So happy we're here. Thank you for taking the time. Who are you and what do you do? Yeah, thank you very much for asking me to be a part of this. I um, am very happy to represent fungal conservation. My name is Gabriella D'Elia. I am living in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York. I'm originally from the Rocky Mountains in Utah, just next door from here, and um, spent a long time in Seattle, which is where I went to school and also where I fell in love with mushrooms. Um, and so I moved there when I was 18 and well, actually the first ever mushroom I found was almost 10 years ago, this ne these next few weeks. And it was in Utah. And it was right before I was going to college and I was up in the Uinta Mountains and I found these tiny little, I had no idea what they were at the time, mushrooms this big and I noticed them growing on moss just at a lakeside and I freaked out. I was like, oh my God, wild mushrooms. And I looked, looked back at them just a few weeks ago and they're probably just little toxic gallerina, like growing on the moss, a common gallerina species. But that was my first picture I ever took of mushrooms. And um, then a few weeks later, I moved to Seattle and saw mushrooms this big of Amanita muscaria. And that just stopped me in my tracks. I sat with them for probably an hour or two and I had never seen anything like that before in my life. So that was really my first first love story was with the Amanitas, such a charismatic mushroom. I started spending personal time going out and exploring Washington State and just tripping over mushrooms, you know, having no idea what I was looking at. Um, didn't have a clue if this was the same species to this one or even the same, you know, if this one was just an older or a baby one. I had no idea, but I just thought they were so incredibly beautiful. Started looking them up, reading books, going to um, my local bookstore, Elliott Bay Book Company. I, I opened up All That the Rain Promises and More, and I, I just, I think I cried. I was like, this, this is, I need to meet these people. I need to learn more, spend more time with these mushrooms and the mushroom people seem like such lovely, fun, wild organisms. And um, while I was in school, I studied environmental studies and I was able to focus on fungal ecology. Um, and none of my professors really knew anything about fungi, but they said, go ahead and do it. I didn't really have much guidance. And, um, I focused on microremediation, knowledge creation, and kind of grassroots creation of microremediation, and the lack of um, um, the lack of transmission between academia and grassroots information. And then, when I graduated, I dove right into the local mushroom society up there, the Puget Sound Mycological Society, and mushroom clubs are such fantastic resources for learning about mushrooms and hanging out with people who know a lot more than you do. So I went to the monthly meetings um, from, you know, on everything from edibility to, to forest health to burn morels and going out with Daniel Winkler and Danny Miller was my first experience following mycologists out in the field and just soaking in what it is that they do. And I loved it so much. Um, it was a part of a fungal diversity survey local project. And so the, I will get further into that, but it's a little network of local bio mushroom biodiversity surveying that is actually um, operated and kind of hosted by the nonprofit that I direct now. But that was my first, that was what really struck me is that my, my interest with mushrooms really opened up when I was able to do field work on them and go outside and just spend time with them and notice what they look like and who they are and taking the notes of their habitats, who they're growing with, um, what kind of conditions are here and reading the story of the ecosystem and the terrain to 
to guess why they might be fruiting right here. Um, and so I, I spent a long time diving in with, the, with that Puget Sound Mycological Society, the um, bridal, bridal trails. Yeah, the Bridal Trails um, Fungal Diversity Survey Local Project. And then I moved back home to grow mushrooms in Utah. I started a business called Moon Mushrooms, which um, created mycoastrological tinctures, medicinal mushroom tinctures, and um, did what I called holistic mycology education, which looked at fungi as not only the incredible science and ecology, but also um, looking at fungi as a language. And then I started volunteering with Fungal Diversity Survey in 2020 as their volunteer blog editor. And the, um, the, the mission of Fungal Diversity Survey is to protect fungi and to do that through engaging community scientists or amateurs, people who just love mushrooms, and partnering with conservationists, professionals, academics to make a movement to do something about fungal protection here in North America. Fungal Diversity Survey, or Fundus for short, is North America's only nonprofit for fungal biodiversity and conservation. It is the only nonprofit in North America working for fungal conservation. Um, the, I slowly just accrued more responsibility and found myself as the director for the past uh, almost couple of years. All right, <laughs> wow. Thanks for telling us a little bit about yourself, about the Fungal Diversity Survey. Um, Please elaborate on some of the current projects. How does the Fungal Diversity Survey accomplish its goals? Yes, thanks for asking. So Fungal Diversity Survey first began as a vision in 2012 at the Mycological Society of America gathering in Georgia where over 200 mushroom lovers, professionals, amateurs, community scientists sat down and said, we have a problem here. We do not know the fungi that exist in North America. Let's do something about it. So it took until 2017 for the nonprofit to form. The nonprofit was co-founded by Stephen Russell and Bill Sheehan. And um, they have, they're no longer with the nonprofit, but um, we have an incredible board. Current president is Adam DeMartino, who could probably also talk if you'd like. He's a co-founder of Smallhold. Um, that's really cool. Yeah. I didn't that. I was, we talked to Andrew and Louis. Yeah, cool. Um, very cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's been, there's been so many people involved in our work and our mission. And um, there have been multiple projects since 2017. Uh, since beginning in 2017, there have been over 8,000 sequences, DNA sequences ran. Um, the, a main part of the mission since 2017 was to sequence DNA because at the beginning of the organization, the slog the, uh, what is it, the slogan? The, the slogan was, without a voucher and a specimen, it's a, sorry, the slogan was, without a specimen and a DNA sequence, it's just a rumor. So in order to conserve fungi, we do need to have these more high quality fungal observations. And not only observations like pictures and putting your photos on iNaturalist, but also acquiring specimens and storing the specimens so that we can do DNA research on them and save specimens in fungaria with, with academic institutions. So a lot of our community science projects center around that process. We have, um, since 2020, the Biodiversity Database, which is a database hosted on iNaturalist. It's a fantastic open source platform. I'm sure Alan represents it very well. Um, I don't think I have to really explain it right here right now, but the iNaturalist um, application has multiple projects on it. So we've created our own project called the Fundus Biodiversity Database. And this database exists to aggregate high quality community science observations. So there's lots of observations on iNaturalist of mushrooms and many of them are like of a mushroom from three feet away, which isn't helpful. And I'm not trying to shame anybody because I once took pictures, I take pictures like that of mushrooms too. Not every picture of a mushroom is scientific and can be used for conservation. So this project really inspires community scientists to, to 
go out in the field, take high quality mushroom observations. We have tons of resources on our website on how to learn more about how, what makes a good mushroom observation, which means you know, plucking, plucking up the mushroom from the base so we get the whole base of the mushroom, um, finding a few different specimens of different maturities, flipping a couple over so we can see different angles, especially of the underside, if there are gills, if there are teeth, pores, and maybe slicing some of the mushroom to see if there's any liquid exudate, like latex or bluing or bruising, and just really capturing these, these details in a photo can go such a long way with giving us the data we need to protect fungi. So we asked community scientists to add their observations to that project, the Fundus Biodiversity Database. A second big project we've been working on are called the Rare Fungi Challenges. The first one we created in 2020, it's called the West Coast Rare Fungi Challenge. So it's a the first time that any um, organized promotion of rare and threatened or underdocumented fungal species on, on a whole region um, has been promoted. And so we've chosen, we at first chose 10 and it went over so well, the second year we added 10 more. So we have 20 targeted, rare, threatened or underdocumented species on the West Coast. We're just helping community scientists and academics and anybody in the world help us build information for these species that might have only been seen like three times or maybe haven't been seen in the past 10 years or 20 years, and helping us build the data, the pictures, the observation um, notes to help us understand more about these rare threatened species. The second rare fungi challenge um, launched last summer in 2022 in the Northeast. So we have the Northeast rare fungi challenge, and then an announcement is that our Southeast, our third Southeast rare fungi challenge is just launching this month just in time for the NAMA, the North American Myco Mycological Association meeting in North Carolina. So um, we have three of those projects. The goal is to create the fourth for probably the Rocky Mountain region. I'm from the Rockies, they're very close to my heart. We have people like Amy Honan and Andy Wilson um, who are already having looking for wanted mushroom species. And we, that's a way that we can engage with professionals to really help them get the specimens they're looking for. They've been doing research for dozens of years. Um, and then our fundus, I'll speak to two more projects, our fundus local projects are a really great way for people to do more sustained research on a given piece of land or creating what is called a funga of the land. Three Fs, I will happily represent that since Julie is not here. Juliana Furchie has been working for at least 10 years, maybe more like 20, to get justice for the fungal kingdom or kingdom. Um, which I prefer to use. And if Julie was here, I know she would really say, please apply the third F. We need to be using flora, fauna, and funga so that fungi can receive the kind of um, awareness, science, education, and funding, conservation that is in place for flora and fauna. So a funga is a... Um, Funga is just the fungi in a certain place or throughout a certain time period. And so the Fundus Local Projects are these um, distributed networks. It's a mycelium of our, of our community science projects. So it's just being a part of our mycelial network of localized conservation surveyors. Anybody can join or start a project. We have over 200 registered local projects. And Quite possibly one of the most important things that anybody can do as a community scientist is to um, observe the same piece of land for mushrooms and fruiting bodies for years, for throughout seasons, throughout time, throughout condition changes, seasonal changes, and add those observations to a, a fundus local project. They can send these specimens to us for free DNA sequencing as well which we're just opening up once again. We've done multiple waves of free DNA sequencing for this, these fund fundus local projects. So throughout the end of 2023, um, they can learn more at fundus.org and see what it takes to submit your specimen to us to get free DNA sequencing. The last project I wanna mention is a, um, an entirely innovative project. We, uh, I'm very grateful to announce that in November of 2022, Fungal Diversity Survey received funding from the state of California and the California Institute for Biodiversity to create a snapshot of fungal biodiversity across the whole state. 
And this is the first time that any nonprofit in North America, since we were the first one, is awarded this kind of funding to study fungi. This is the first time that a workforce has been put together to hire collectors to go out into the field that's not a part of academia. Academia and academic institutions are so incredibly important, but to be successful in our mission to, to protect fungi sooner than later, we really need to develop a mycological workforce that complements academia. So this is the first time that we've hired plenty of collectors to go out. Aaron, Tupac, Aaron Thompson is here, Stu Pickle, Tay Bright is a collector who's here, um, Alan's a collector. We have many collectors going out surveying the whole state. Um, the, every specimen is being saved with Dr. Brian Perry at Cal State East Bay and every specimen also receives a DNA sequence. Um, we have a whole sequencing team. Our sequencing lead is the very knowledgeable heart singer. Um, so it, from field to fungarium and to protection, making sure these data become available to state conservationists and land managers is our end result. So it's very exciting. That is incredible. What a large task. I mean, you get one of the biggest states. Uh, it's not like they gave you Rhode Island to, to start with. Um, so ambitious and very important, and that's a perfect transition. Why is that important? Why is yes. all of this conservation important and the work that the Fungal Diversity Survey does? Yes, thank you for asking that. Yes, we, we pretty quickly realized that, okay, yeah, Cal it's not Rhode Island that we're starting out on, and we're looking for specimens throughout all sorts of habitats, all sorts of different guilds, different, we're really just trying to fill in the blanks of, of California biodiversity because it's not like it hasn't been worked on before. There have been plenty of mycologists to go through the state, but this is a long-term three to five year focused effort in which we're doing just more localized focused research to fill in the gaps and see if we can really, um, you know, one of the important measures with California is California is a biodiversity hotspot. It's known to have, um, tons of biodiversity, species richness of both plants and animals, but that is not known for fungi. So we're really trying to see if we can help understand that through this project in the next few years. As far as why fungal conservation matters generally, there is an estimated two to maybe six million species of fungi that might exist, and we only have documented 5% of them. Compared to plants, we've probably documented maybe 90% of plants. And if we think of how amazing, I mean, we're here at the Telluride Mushroom Festival. This is my favorite gathering for mushrooms out of the whole year. And we all just get to steep in each other's inspiration and learn about what we're working on, learn about what each other's doing, why we're interested in mushrooms. We all love mushrooms so much here. And everybody here is so tuned into how incredible these fungi are, this whole kingdom of life, and with only 5% of them described, just think what might be possible if we discovered more about the fungal kingdom. So everything from like themes that we're learning here at the Telluride Mushroom Festival, especially this year, is, is resilience. And I think resilience is a really good comprehensive umbrella theme for like interconnectivity. We know that fungi connect to over 90% of plant roots throughout the globe. We would not have resilient trees and plants and agriculture and crops without the fungi. Seedlings wouldn't be germinating without fungi. We need fungi for resilient, regenerative land and forest and habitat basically on earth, as well as decomposition. Fungi are responsible for over 90% of decomposition on the earth. Medicinally, Fungi are um, beneficial for the planet, as well as our own body ecosystem, our mental ecosystem. And if we think of the most famous example, penicillin, from the fungus penicillium, that has ch altered our world and um, w saved hundreds of millions of lives. We probably wouldn't have won World War II without this life-saving fungus. And Think of all the other medicinal properties we're, we're learning through through John Michelotti, through Robert Rogers. We're really getting a better understanding of also psychologically how fungi can really open up our souls and our, our, our minds. Since there's such a huge kingdom of life that we know so little about, there's so much discovery abound. 
all of Earth is changing. Europeans noticed fungi declines in the 80s and 90s and they acted on it. United States and North America doesn't have a baseline understanding of the fungi in order to see if certain species are thriving or declining. So in order to protect fungi, we have to understand who is there. We have to do a basic inventory and we have to do long-term monitoring in order to see what's happening, what are the trends. And there are plenty of threats to fungi, just like there are plenty of ecological threats to most organisms alive right now. A lot of the threats to fungi include habitat, um, include habitat decline, climate change, um, especially with fungi land fragmentation. You know, their mycelial networks like to be connected and strengthened that way. A lot of our development fragments habitat. Another large threat is soil compaction. Fungi need air to breathe. So fungi exude glomalin, which is responsible for soil architecture and, and stability and porosity. And so we need airy soils, and the compaction is another large threat to fungi. Um, as well, a, larger, a large threat is also la la lack of habitat, loss of habitat. If we think of what we're learning about fungi, they're really telling us that ecosystems are interconnected. It becomes difficult to isolate fungi from the trees, from the squirrels and the deer and the bugs and the insects that sometimes make, um, like, essential relationships to certain fungal species. And so when sometimes tree hosts are declining, that means that the fungus associates probably in decline as well. We know from plant research that a lot of tree and plant species are being threatened, but we, aren't, we don't have the adequate data to show that the, their fungal associations might be declining just yet. So that's what we're working on. And I would say that the largest threat to fungi right now is lack of awareness. Lack of awareness, lack of understanding, that the fungi are such primary actors in the ecosystem. Even that they are there at all. Even that they're there at all. And so all of us who are here have a really incredible opportunity to share with our communities how important fungi are and what they're doing in our ecosystems, our friends, our family, even if it's just talking about mushrooms at the dinner table, asking your local politicians who are doing biodiversity analysis, who are doing biodiversity work, who are trying to make biodiversity stuff happen, ask them what they think about fungi. Have they included fungi in their science, in their, po in their policies, in their laws? Um, so where we're getting is um, in order to protect fungi, we need to know who's out there. And the community scientists can help us, academics can help us. We're all on this shared mission, fungal education, videos like this, more fungal cultivators all across, telling people how mushrooms grow, demystifying fungi, bringing them into our homes, um, the many years of treating fungi as pests and as nothing but diseases or something that's dangerous has, has created an impasse with fungal conservation right now. So all of us who are here, we have this incredible opportunity to really make it known how just amazing and essential fungi are. And we're all on that shared mission that will help protect fungi. What are some challenges that you guys face uh, day to day and, and sort of large, ever looming challenges to accomplish these goals? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, California is a big place. Uh, and um, getting all this done is a lot of work. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, speaking to just piggybacking off what I just said, the awareness is one of the largest challenges. There's plenty of funding out there for biodiversity work that recognizes plants and animals and grant work, you know, looking at foundation work, which is where a lot of nonprofits get most of their funding. And a lot of places don't recognize fungi as something that's important or something that's part of, it's this kind of confusing puzzle piece that not a lot of, um, I, uh, not a lot of frameworks understand how to integrate yet. So I think it's a cultural problem that we are healing altogether. By, by helping all the little interlocking, interwoven pieces help understand fungi so that they can be funneled to where it makes a difference. Um, funding is really our main issue. Um, if we've understood, we've had this really fantastic 
um, first year almost of this California based project. And California is this incredible state that's really focused on, on ecology. It's part of the state's executive order to help preserve 30% of it by 2030, right? Which is an incredible feat. But that means that they've opened up funding to help understand all kinds of biodiversity within the state. They're a very forward thinking state. So if California does something, other states tend to follow. So we hope that this kind of work can be not expanded or scaled because that's not how this sort of work um, succeeds, but it can be replicated and localized across North America. Um, so really having, um, you know, we've had really good and wonderful support from our local mycological community, but um, getting the kind of, getting the kind of monetary support is really what we're seeking right now for our organization to take the next step. Every state's got a state bird and a state flower, and so there's an initiative to have a state mushroom and, and the fungal diversity survey is involved with that? I mean, it's not so much a fungal diversity survey initiative as it is a, a commonly understood mushroom person initiative that we've all come to and, and seen that there are maybe six states that have state mushrooms right now and for the past few years there's been much more of a push to get states recognizing fungi on their state symbol list. And while it's not so much of a push from our organization, it can very greatly change how fungi are perceived, how fungi are taken care of and accepted on a, a political status, on a legal status. So um, California just passed its state mushroom in the past year. They have the California Golden Chanterelle, which is very exciting. I wanted that for Maine. You did? Well, it's not the California Golden Chanterelle, but Maine gets great. Well, uh, what, what do you think should be Maine's state mushroom? Well, the lobster mushroom would make a lot of sense. We get a lot of those, and lobsters are a very popular uh, That's food. That's perfect. In Maine. Uh, so, although that may be too confusing, I don't know. But it no, makes, screw it. It makes a lot of sense. Um, so that would be maybe my vote. Oh my gosh! Top of my head. That's so perfect. Yeah. So um, the we just worked with. The Mushroom Society of Utah, I'm from Utah, and I was the vice president for that society, and we worked for the past year on getting Porcini. We got Bolitas edulis passed as the state mushroom in Utah with the help of Bryn Dentinger, Keaton Tremble, Chandler Rosenberg, Katie Lawson, Ashley, Simon, a lot of us. It takes a team to do all this work together. And um, we chose that mushroom because it's an important ectomycorrhizal fungus that forms associations with fir and spruce trees especially in more montane, high elevation forests across Utah that are um, experiencing larger, quicker changes as our climate um, adapts. So lobster mushroom sounds amazing. Another initiative that is just a conservation initiative generally, um, well, I'll just say it. the state mushrooms are, are not a fundus initiative, but I think anybody, people coming from clubs, people coming from as individuals, Check to see if you have a state mushroom. Only maybe six or seven do. If you don't, get one. It's not that difficult usually. We had a pretty decent time in Utah and the New York state fungus um, that's slated is Lactarius pecchii. And so this is an important signifier of forest health just like the Boletus edulis in Utah that we recently passed. Lactarius pecchii is this milky cap that's got kind of like a orangey, rusty, red cap. Uh, on the underside, the gills, if you slice them, they bleed this white latex, liquid latex, which is characteristic of milky caps or the Lactarius species, the Lactarius genus. And so Lactarius pecchii is um, being promoted as uh, well, it's being advocated for um, as New York State mushroom because it has these beneficial interactions with the forest, as well as New York State botanist Howard Peck. Or sorry, Thomas Horton. Wow, Thomas Horton Peck? Yeah, I think it's Thomas Horton Peck. I'll just say New York botanist Peck was, he described over, I think, a couple thousand species in the state. It's named after him, Charles Horton Peck. And uh, mycologist Gertrude Burlingham was the one who actually found it that supports this sort of untold w woman in mycology story that can deserve more recognition. And so, um, yeah. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, thank you. I really think that's fun. And I'm going to get on that. Mm -hmm. um, you should. I think that'd be a really, really fun initiative uh, for us to work on. It's perfect. Um, 
So how does this all tie into the Telluride Mushroom Festival? Mm. How does this place, uh, what does it mean to you? What's your involvement with it? Um, and why are festivals and like this important? Like I said, I think the largest threat to fungi is the lack of awareness. And the more festivals, the more parties, the more dinners, education, textbooks, meeting groups, clubs that we have for fungi, we can make a difference through that. The networks will make us protect fungi better. Um, this Telluride Mushroom Festival is my favorite mushroom gathering. There's nothing like coming to this magical valley. At the end of it is a waterfall. One way in, one way out. Mushrooms is the corridor. And we're, I mean, we're at like 10,000 feet here. It's, I'm from the Rocky Mountains. I'm so grateful for this land being my home, I feel a really deep connection to the to the mountains, the rockiness of these mountains and the firs and the spruce here. Um, the mushrooms here, I love alpine mushrooms. They might be some of my favorite mushrooms, but I don't really have a favorite mushroom. It's really just the last one I saw. Um, but there's something really special about mushrooms in the mountains, um, especially in these drier climates that might not always be as wet and as moist as somewhere like the tropics or Florida or something. You just never know what you might find. Um, this festival is a gathering place for families and for friends for decades and for multiple generations. There have been children who have grown up here. There have been um, people, there have been marriages that have been people who have gotten together, people who have met here, myself included. We've met, John and I met here. This place is a, is a meeting ground for, for um, not only people who are doing mushroom work, but people who are just curious. And so it's a really inspirational place where a lot of discussion, a lot of questioning can happen. And um, here I really, I really value the, the support that is felt from peers who are working within mycology. Um, out in the world, maybe it can feel a little desolate sometimes when, when not everybody's a mushroom person, but when you come here and you feel the inspiration and you hear the poetry and the singing and the presentations and how much work everybody else is doing, it can really fill your spirit and it lasts throughout the whole year. Um, I really represent here, I'm, I'm very grateful to represent fungal conservation, especially in North America. I have a, a team of dozens and dozens of people that I'm standing for here. And so many people have done work for me to be able to present on our findings, our recent findings. And I'm, I'm very grateful for everybody involved. Um, my, my, my mission here with Telluride is, is, to, is to have fun and to, to help open people's eyes. You know, each and every person can become a community scientist. Each and every person has the ability to help protect fungi. And that's really what I want to share here. Thank you so much, <laughs> Gabriella uh, Delia. Gabriella Delia. Delia. Yeah. I apologize. It's good. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me and yeah. to talk to Norspore yeah. um, and all the people who um, you know are interested in, in fungi and uh, or fungi or fungi uh, <laughs> conservation. Mm -hmm. Thanks again. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you all wanting to, to promote the protection component of it. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah.